Good evening. My name is Bill Satterwhite. I'm president of the Board of Trustees of the Library. On behalf of the board and the staff, I want to welcome you to a very special presentation tonight. Last spring, in anticipation of the showing of the, the war, the miniseries on WLL, they asked libraries to interview veterans. In our case, we also filmed those interviews with the auspices of our very talented AV director, Mike, who's hiding behind me here, <laughs> who's a, a film producer of his own right. The, uh, we had three teens who helped us with the recommendation of Sparky Songer, and Sparky also let us use the War Museum. Uh, John Jong with the handheld camera, Ryan Brown, and Brent Cohey helped with the questions. <laughs> and nearly all the people who were interviewed are here tonight. Joe McCormick. Where's Joe? Okay. And Helen Montgomery. And Dr. Bill Catapple and his wife Betty. Dr. Gerald Suley. Milt Crippen, Charles Dukes, and John Sant was un unable to be with us. He is attending a POW reunion in Springfield, I believe. And then, last but not least, walking in the door is our very own Sparky Songer. <laughs> Mike was able to condense up to an hour of each interview into three to five minute clips, which is what's an extremely difficult process. These clips will be, you can view them on WLL's website. And also a special thanks again to Sparky for letting us use the War Museum and to recommending the veterans and uh, giving us the tips on the, the young gentleman that helped us. Also want to thank Mary Kaufman, who's going to moderate our panel discussion tonight. And finally, finally and most importantly, we want to thank Kimberly Chronic and the WLL for be, uh, inviting us to participate in this project. There will be very brief delays between, between some of the clips because of the having to switch CDs around. So without further ado, I'll introduce Kimberly to take it from here. Thank you, Bill. And it's so great to see all of you here tonight. This is wonderful. This is our uh, sixth event, uh, working with others to tell the stories of veterans from central Illinois. And I appreciate everyone who came here and the veterans and the, the library who's been a great partner to work with. Um, we know that during World War II, between the years of 1939 and 1945, 50 to 80 million people perished in that war. The vast majority of them were civilians. More than 405,000 U.S. Um, airmen, seamen, and Marines were killed during the war. And so for all those who were killed and were injured, I'd like to just invite you for, to share with me a moment of silence. Ken Burns and Lynn Novak started uh, working on the program, The War, that is airing on WILL back in 2000. It took them more than six years to make this program. And what's unique about this program is it tells about the war, both on the battlefield and the home front, from the people who were there. It's not told from the perspective of the generals. It's not told from the perspective of scholarly experts. It's individuals like you and me who were there during this time. And we think that's what makes it so powerful. And WILL is, just like Ken Burns, is aware that over a thousand veterans a day from World War II are passing onward. And so we wanted to work with libraries to gather their stories because there's a tremendous need in the schools for the uh, kids to have these stories, first-hand accounts. Many children today believe we were allies with Germany during World War II. 
So, so we are producing a lot of local materials to give to teachers. And if you are a teacher or know a teacher, uh, please see me afterwards. We would love to get that material in your hands. Um, also, I want to let you know that we are very, um, we very much appreciate your feedback. We want to know how we did. And uh, outside, there's a green survey. If you wouldn't mind, please filling that out after the event. We'd really appreciate that. And um, also, uh, uh, you may already know that Marion Blumenthal Lazan, who was a child and survived the Holocaust during World War II, she'll be here next Wednesday at 7 p.m. And she'll also be in Charleston the next day at 7 p.m. And there's a flyer on that as well. So um, we appreciate your being here. And now without further delay, let us look at a eight minute segment from the war that's been airing on WIL. If you've missed it, every Wednesday night for the next five nights, five Wednesdays, we'll be repeating that series. So eight until 10 p.m. every Wednesday night for the next five weeks, you can watch the war. All of our local stories, be it radio or television or oral histories, we're collecting more than 70 oral histories, um, will be on our website. And we're sending those to the Library of Congress so that future scholars and students can access this material because we believe that people don't really know what it was like and these stories help tell, tell the story. So here we are now with the uh, opening segment from The War by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. One evening, in the summer of 1941, several months before the United States would be drawn into the Second World War, in a little farming town in Alabama, a 16-year-old high school boy named Glenn Dowling Frazier discovered that the girl he loved was interested in someone else. Frazier was so angry and upset that when the owner of a juke joint refused him service, he stalked outside, climbed onto his motorcycle, and roared through the door, shattering bottles and smashing furniture. As he raced away, the bar owner chased him down the street with a shotgun. The next morning, humiliated, scared, and unable to face his parents, Glenn Frazier went to the nearest recruiting office, lied about his age, and joined the peacetime army. He volunteered to serve in the Philippines. When I uh, volunteered for the Philippine Islands, I had no idea that we would actually be in a war. I was thinking that probably Germany was the most likely place that there would be a war. So in my mind, I thought it'd be safe over there. I never thought Japan would be attacking us. Over the next four years, Frazier would find himself in the midst of war, desperate hand-to-hand -hand combat, a forced march so brutal the world would never forget it, and nightmarish prison camps where simply surviving required luck and bravery and unshakable will. Back in Alabama, those who loved him would be told he was dead. All Glenn Frazier would be able to do was cling to the hope that one day he could come back home. I don't think there is such a thing as a good war. There are sometimes necessary wars. And I think one might say just wars. And that it never, I never questioned the necessity of that war, and I still do not question it. It was something that had to be done. The greatest cataclysm in history grew out of ancient and ordinary human emotions. Anger and arrogance and bigotry. 
victimhood, and the lust for power. And it ended because other human qualities, courage and perseverance and selflessness, faith, leadership, and the hunger for freedom combined with unimaginable brutality to change the course of human events. The Second World War brought out the best and the worst in a generation and blurred the two so that they became at times almost indistinguishable. In the killing that engulfed the world from 1939 to 1945, between 50 and 60 million people died. So many, and in so many different places, that the real number will never be known. More than 85 million men and women served in uniform, but the overwhelming majority of those who perished were civilians. Men, women, and children obliterated by the arithmetic of war. The United States of America was relatively fortunate More than 405,000 soldiers and sailors, airmen and marines died. But that figure represented proportionately fewer military casualties than were suffered by any of the other major combatants. American cities were not destroyed. American civilians were never really at risk. But without American power, without the sacrifice of American lives, the struggle's outcome would have been very different. The American economy only grew stronger as the fighting went on. And by the time it ended, the United States would be the most powerful nation on earth. And a once isolated and insular people would find themselves at the center of world affairs. The war touched every family, on every street, in every town in America. Towns like Laverne, Minnesota, Sacramento, California, Waterbury, Connecticut, and Mobile, Alabama and nothing would ever be the same again. I'm not sure I can speak about why human beings in general go to war. I think that's a pretty large category. I can only speak about why 18-year-olds from Minneapolis go to war. They go to war because it's impossible not to because uh, a current is established in the society so swift, flowing toward war, that every young man who steps into it is carried downstream. The year was 1943 when Harold G. Songer, president and curator of the Vermilion County War Museum in Danville, was drafted into the U.S. Army. Harold, better known as Sparky, works here as a volunteer. He's a war veteran and lifelong military man committed to providing a place where both the young and old can learn or reflect on war history. Seldom does a day go by when Sparky doesn't recall the bloodiest days of World War II. Surrounded by war memorabilia and dressed in a jacket similar to the one he wore when the Battle of the Bulge broke on December 16, 1944, he recalls the final days of that surprise attack by the Germans in Belgium. 
deep in the Ardennes forest. When the Battle of the Bulge opened up, uh, they knocked out our division in three days' time. And uh, we fought until we ran out of everything. And Colonel Cavender came up in the morning of the 19th. And I remember very well, and he asked us if we wanted to fight to the finish or surrender. Uh, we said we'd fight to the finish because he had no communication from our headquarters. He didn't know what to do either. But uh, he said, destroy and tear up your uh, weapons. The rifle, you could pull it back and take the pin out of it and throw it away. But they were gas-loaded cylinder. And he had a clip that went up inside, I think eight or nine, 10 shells in a clip. So you take the clip out and strip the shells out, throw them away in the clip. But a lot of the guys forgot about that one in the chamber already there. And uh, during frustration and everything, it would take uh, the end of the, the barrel and slam it up against a tree. And uh, when they did, uh, there was a, one hell of a commotion, screaming and everything. Uh, they'd shoot themselves right through the stomach. Not intentionally. Uh, they frustrated and, and uh, for, forgot about that one. And, uh, so they were dropping. We were yelling. We just had about six weeks of infantry training before we went over. And, uh, so, but at two o'clock in the afternoon, my sergeant has just got killed right beside of me and I hit the ground and I raised my head and the sniper hit a spoon I had in my pocket, which I have now, but this is not the jacket. This is the one that's in the museum here. But the spoon was in my pocket. Why I had it, I'll never know uh, because I had nothing to eat with it. We were just eating K rations at the time. Uh, but it bent the spoon, as you can see, that's where it hit. And the lead portion of the bullet dropped in my pocket. And uh, after we surrendered and the Germans uh, searched this whatnot, uh, they took the lead portion of the bullet, uh, kept it and gave me back the spoon. That's the only thing I had to eat with when we got in prison camp. After they marched us out of the woods and put us up in the barn lot, for the night, we had to, we filled up a barn lot and we just stomped all night long trying to keep warm. It was finally on it was my 32nd mission that we were flying. Uh, we were heading for Czechoslovakia to go to Blackhammer, which had uh, oil refineries. I got shot down, and that was in July, Friday, July 7th of uh, 44. We were walking down the railroad tracks, and there was a work crew there, and the one fellow says in perfect English, this is Friday, you're going to have a very poor lunch. And I thought, where were you about an hour ago when I could have used somebody who spoke English? And they talk about Friday the 13th. Friday the 7th is a little more shaky to me than Friday the 13th. But anyhow, after we're in prison camp, about two weeks later, who comes marching into prison camp but Old Bob Schomp and his crew, who's my roommate in flying school, he was my roommate for the rest of the war.
they had guard towers at each corner of the uh, compounds. Then they had double barbed wire below that, and then there was a space of about, oh, I'd say 15 feet. They had a low barbed wire stretching there, and you didn't go beyond that. If you did, you maybe uh, got shot. The barracks I was in, we had, uh, I think there were 10 rooms, and there were, we, were, we ended up with about 20 guys to a room, which was about uh, 16 feet by 14 feet, and slept in uh, three high bunks. We had arguments, though I never saw a, another, uh, one fellow take a punch at another guy. And that I always thought was rather unique. And if you got in an argument with somebody, you okay, go out and do a walk around the compound and get over it and then go back to what we were doing before. Uh, we did our own cooking. Uh, the food was mostly very sparse. We got Red Cross parcels every once in a while, but they were few and far between. I'll have to say, of what I've heard of the other camps, what I've heard of the guys in the South Pacific and Japan, we, we were pretty well off. Maybe not the best of affairs, but uh, at least uh, we didn't, uh, one thing was in our favor, being officers, you, didn't, you weren't required by the Geneva Convention to work. I've been back over there a few years ago and went back to visit and I think I found the place where I had landed when I bailed out and while we were there looking it over a woman from across the road came over and wanted to know what we were doing and we explained to her and she says oh she says I remember seeing somebody land in that field she said, and then after everybody cleared out, we went over and got the parachute and took it home so that the kids made clothes for the kids. And uh, she, said, I, she said, I was 10 years old at the time. In Barth, they made, it, they made quite a bit of it because they had a uh, scale model of the camp, which we could see. This is when I went back on the tour. And they had a gal there, and she was the historian, and she knew quite a bit about it. And we asked them about the fact that did they, uh, how did they feel having a prisoner of war camp right next to their town? And they said, actually, they felt very good about it because they figured if they had a prisoner of war camp there, the Allies weren't going to be bombing there. <laughs> so <laughs> that saved them that. I was in charge of an engine room. There were nine engine rooms on this dry dock. Each section of that dry dock had two major diesels that turned two large generators that supplied power for all of the ballast valves and the 200 horsepower pumps. 18 diesels turning 18 generators you were getting 440 volts steady and 220 amps, approximately. There was a lot of electricity. And the diesel people and the uh, electri electricians worked together. There was a great big switchboard. It lit up like a Christmas tree. And I was a talker on the phones for a while. That's where I learned this Abel Baker Charlie. And a docking officer used to say, Abel Baker Charlie, start your starboard pumps and run them for three minutes. And the electricians would hit the button and those breakers on those switch boxes, you could hear them. And those big pumps, you could see the uh, shaft turning on them. And then they'd speed up and the breakers on those switch boxes would kick in. 
So then in our off times, the electricians would open up those boxes and file those breakers so they would work good. This 1945 electrical service was raw and dangerous. These, these men knew what they were doing. But the dry dock was uh, broken down and it ended up in the harbor of Portland, Maine and it's used right now. They broke down all these sections. That was as long as a football field. You know, the USS Pennsylvania was built in 1915. It was an old battleship, and it served in World War I and World War II, and there were 24 sailors killed in that initial torpedo attack at Iwo Jima. And when the Pennsylvania came into our dry dock, uh, the burial crew was there. There was an 18-foot hole in the back of the Pennsylvania. And the recovery uh, team, uh, had to, well, the ship fitters, when it was hit by the torpedo, uh, immediately dogged down all of the hatches on the after part of the battleship. And there were people in there still alive, and they couldn't get out. But in order for the ship not to sink, these men sacrificed their lives. So when the burial crew came in at Guam, they brought all of the coffins over on the back of our dry dock and took these men out one at a time and had a service for them. It was kind of heart-rendering to see that happen. We were just out of high school and uh, um, maybe some of us a year or two, you know, but, uh, and it was hard to do um, learning all the different things that you shouldn't do. And, and you had to learn about all the gases, know what they were, you had to know about first aid and, uh, and know how to help somebody if they broke a bone or something like that. And this, all those little basic things. And uh, somebody said, uh, gases, what does mustard gas smell like? I said, mustard and then run like everything. <laughs> so we had to fill in places where the men were already gone. So we had to do that. And just like uh, when I was called in when that hospital and they were short nurses and surgery, I had to go whether I had the experience or not. One day, uh, this uh, one soldier, everybody else got on, you know, to go ambulance to go to the hospital, but there was one short, and this was this young fellow that was 19 years old that was badly wounded, but he was screaming for his mommy. I never forgot that. And so I just cradled him in my arms like this and said, Mommy is right here. You, you, you just stop hollering. I'll take care of you. You just be a good boy. And uh, pretty soon he, you know, went back to sleep. But I never forgot that because I had blood on my uniform. And uh, so, but when we got to the hospital, he was in a different section of the hospital where I was working. So we, we were like practical nurses and doing everything that uh, the you know, regular would do because there was a shortage of everybody. You, you can't be in two places at one time. And uh, th this is something you never forgot. And uh, it's just part of your memory. Uh, but I never forgot that young girl. You were not supposed to show any emotion at all. If you did, you cried inside. And we did a lot of that. <laughs>
and uh, uh, whatever they told you to do, you, did, you, you didn't quibble. I want people to know that women did their share. And there's a lot of unknown, untold stories that I'm trying to get a hold of the rest. Of, I know what my group did, but what do the other parts of the country do? And the biggest problem was going into the beach. It had a three day storm and uh, we lost 16 tanks. Some of the uh, landing craft were swamped. So the seas were high. Yeah. And we were bailing water out with the helmets and all that. Everybody was seasick. Yeah. We did, we got, we got in there. We lost about, uh, I don't know, somebody said 150, 200 men. Omaha Beach lost several thousand. And the medics, some of the guys they give two and three shots of morphine to, mm. right on the spot. And they died quietly. Mm. Now you see men out there that got an arm blowed off, a leg blowed off, crawling along with these entrails hanging out. Smell of dead men. A burning man smells like bacon. You see so much. Well, people are trying to kill you in any way they can. You get wounded the first time. Now me, I was in there, what, seven weeks. I begin to think, oh, hey, I'm not going to get it. Why am I got it? Then you go in there, and the second time you get hit, you know damn well you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And from there on, you watch it, because mm -hmm. you're going to get it. Got discharged on August the 15th, that VJ day. I got into Chicago. Chicago's wild, VJ day and all. Three days later, I got out of a bar. I had my railroad ticket, my money, and a bottle of whiskey in every pocket. I got to Danville. Staggered up Main Street. My mother and my sister right across the street. I didn't even see them. Got home. Had to pull my pants down to show my dad I had my legs. I couldn't get a job. I was combat infantry. Everybody figured you were a psycho and they didn't want you. They couldn't trust you. So I went back into the Army, and uh, on October the 15th, I was back on board a ship. Got out in 66. And I was in the uh, retired reserve until 82. That was me in 1980. I it won't fit in it now. Well, then your 89th Station Hospital was divided up into uh, two doctors and nine enlisted men. And then you were to be sent up along New Guinea uh, to help with the troops as they invaded New Guinea. And then what happened to the other doctor that was with you? He had developed Tsutsu Gamuchi fever. Tsutsu Gamuchi is a disease of the tropics. 
And the natives and are, they, are immune to it. The natives are immune, but the American people, the troops are not. And he, he died. He was, he and I shared a tent together at that time. And then when you found the, the uh, rat's nest under his, uh, under his tent and under his cot, he might have gotten it that way. So you decided that you should have some cement under your tents. Uh, uh, there, there was a, a group of Australian troops uh, there, there at Boone, and we saw them using a cement mixer. So uh, I went up and met with them and asked if we could make an arrangement to borrow their cement mixer. So they gave me the handle and I would, the, the motor turned and bang. The, the, the handle blew off and, and uh, hit him in the nose and uh, broke his nose. He was the only doctor around to fix it. So he had to fix his own nose. So the uh, other uh, eight men, the enlisted men, uh, made him a purple heart. They carved out and they used a little wire and put valor on it and they found something red for the ribbon. I was up on deck and we suddenly we noticed instead of Heading toward the United States, the ship had made a turn and was heading back toward Australia. <laughs> That's what was going on. They said they had found that two Australian girls had hidden themselves away and down in the machine sh sh shops in the ship and was tr trying to fly back to, to the United States with her Yankee boyfriends. <laughs> and so what did they do? But then we turned around, we went right straight back to, to Australia. And, uh, an Australian cru cruiser came out and met us, and they picked up the girls, and we never saw them again. <laughs> okay. We were to attack uh, a very strategic hill. Of course, everyone was strategic, but this is Hill 303 at, at outside of Erschwaller, Germany, just an ordinary village. We lost, I later found out years later, we lost 78 men in that attack and counterattack. There's only 42 men out of my company left. It, it took me 10 days of marching from the day I was captured to get back to Limburg, which was a holding camp, and then we were taken out of the big camps by a boxcar and put into this labor camp. And uh, then it got to the point when the, uh, the Russians were coming through, pushing while the German soldiers from the front lines would come down and they'd see that it was a prison camp along the road, and then they'd open up their smizers and everything else. So for the last four or five days, we had to stay on the floor. We just laid on the floor all day, couldn't go to work or anything else. And that's when the guards finally said, we got to get out of here. The Russians were coming, so the guards said, we'll take you to the American lines if you'll give us your word that you will not have us punished for being your guard. Well, these were older men in World War I, most of them, so we made agreement. But by the time we could get everything together and leave, and we were in such physical condition, we couldn't go very far. So I finally got picked up in uh, Berlin and then I was sold in a Russian prison camp by the Russian war. So you were in a German prison camp and a Russian prison Russian. camp? Russian. Finally, after about seven days, I could see that they were shipping them out of our camp to Siberia. A lot of DPs, displaced persons and anybody. So another kid and I stole a pair of wild cars and we cut our way out of the fence right along them. Uh, the, the guard tower, cut the two bottom strands and crawled through and then took off across a minefield and headed for the woods. And, and then he and I got separated that night and I headed west and I traveled only at night and I'd, hit, I'd hide during the day in the woods. 
And I finally got to Wittenberg on the Elbe River on the morning of the fourth day I was traveling. And that's as far as I could go. I more or less passed out. The uh, medic was working me over and made, weighing me and all that kind of stuff. And the last sentence I remember, he asked me, uh, what did you weigh when you were in combat? And I said, I weighed 180 pounds. And he said, you know what you weigh now? I said, no, I weighed 109 pounds. And that's all I remember. And near the end, my wife said, in a kind of a, a nice way, that I think it's about time you wrote this book about your experiences. Because she didn't know anything about me. Uh, all she knew was I was having nightmares every night, and that was it. So after Christmas, she said, after Christmas is over, we're going to sit down and we're going to write this book. And I'd write oh, all morning, and then maybe I could stand it till about noon, and I'd have to quit. My nerves were just shot. So she sat downstairs and started deciphering as best she could my notes. We kept at it. I finally got everything ready by November, and by then I finally told Gracie, I said, I'm done. I said, I can't stand it anymore. This is it. So we got it together, and I sent it into a publisher up in Chelsea, Michigan. We sent it out the last week of November, and I have not had a nightmare since that day that book went out of the house. We shipped it out. Never had a nightmare since. I can say nothing but highest praise for them because this was their country and it was being devastated by the by the Axis powers. Mm -hmm. So we felt, in a sense, we felt sorry for them, but we, we did everything possible because I repeat, they are they were our friends, mm -hmm. and we were their friends, and we ran across quite a few families, and they were delightful because they they wanted to take good care of us. And we loved it. their cooking it was excellent. And the French families would save the eggs from legitimate chickens and so forth and give them to us. It, it would be a, we would bring candy and so forth. And uh, and the, on the Sunday morning, we would line up at the mess tent with our, holding our eggs. And the man in front of me was a good friend of mine. And just as he got just short of the mess sergeant to take the eggs to cook them up for him, he stumbled and tripped and broke the eggs on the ground. If you've ever heard a man cry, <laughs> it was Artie Seaton. He, he ended up making a second call to get a second repair. Little things were so important to us. So I ended up going to the <clears throat> Mediterranean and we're in Monte Carlo, which I was seated with a, beside a, a, an American ACAC, and he was a master sergeant, so we got talking <clears throat> while we were on the bus going from one location to another. And I said, did your unit sergeant shoot down any planes? Because that was their mission. He said, yes, he said, we did. He said it was the wrong one. We hit a, an American plane by mistake. Now he said, we did everything right. But he said, it was, it was identified, it did not identify itself. So really the plane did the wrong thing. And it was, now the bad part was not only that, but there was a person on that plane who was very well known and it was Glenn Miller. He said Glenn Miller was overseas and played for the troops. And he said he happened to be, the record showed that he was on that plane. And he said, we, that's, I have heard how Glenn Miller died. They're all mysterious cases. I have to believe the Master Sergeant. Dear Mr. McCormick, <clears throat> this is from Dominique Bichard. It is a pleasure 
for me to inform you that you are eligible to receive the French diploma from the government of France for your contributions in the fight to liberate France from the Axis powers in World War II. People of France and my government are delighted to be able to present to you a special diploma in recognition of your unselfish action and your efforts on behalf of France and the free French people wherever. Merci beaucoup. I do remember some of my French. <laughs> for all those, for everything you did for France, warmest regards. Great, and now we're going to move the tables together and ask our panelists and our moderator to please come forward for some live discussion, and then we will take your questions, so we hope that you'll, you'll have some as well. And I think we're ready to start, so we want to thank Mary Coppin for agreeing to moderate our panel. Mary? All right, I think we've got it. Some of us are not very used to show business. I'm not, in fact. Uh, I had a chance to view the videotape that you just saw twice, and both times I've been so tremendously moved by it, it almost speaks for itself. But I did think of several questions that I was going to start out asking some of our panelists, and then we really want the audience to take part in this. I recognize some people in the audience, I know there are some people here who lived through World War II who perhaps have some of their own memories to share, and who also would like to ask questions of our panelists. One of the questions I was thinking about uh, is for Helen Montgomery. Uh, Mrs. Montgomery mentioned that there are many women's stories during the war that have not yet been told, and I had not really heard prior to watching the videotape of the particular women's association that she spoke of, the American Women's Voluntary Service. So Mrs. Montgomery, could you tell us how you heard of this service and uh, how you volunteered for it? Where did they send you first? Um, we, uh, we were living in California at that time, near Brisbane, California. And my brother had uh, enlisted in the US Navy um, and a year before, he was like one month of being 18. And so he went, and then he went to uh, Hawaii at, at Pearl, and he was in the radio department at the US West Virginia. And so we were more interested in what's going on that time. And so uh, when Pearl, when the Japanese attacked uh, Pearl, well, uh, the West Virginia was the only one that had uh, information that the Japanese were going to attack um, uh, sometime. They didn't know what they intercepted that message. So my brother was came back to uh, San Pedro on radio naval business. And uh, so when he was gone, uh, well, when they attacked it that Sunday, well, he um, was, uh, the torpedo went right through where his bunk, where he would have been there. So it was just one miracle, and he went back. Uh, and, uh, and he said at that time he didn't, uh, uh, he never swore in his life at that time when, when he uh, went down to take, went back to take his buddies out of the ship, you know, uh, open the hatches and put them in body bags. And so uh, I was really interested in getting into something after that, but women weren't allowed anything, but then, Later on, the War Department, this, after the attack, uh, wanted women to be anything. So the War Department issued where the women uh, would be in a voluntary service, the American Women's Voluntary Service. That was one of the secrets of World War II that President Roosevelt uh, 
had hatched up. <laughs> and, uh, before, and so see, the wax weren't, um, uh, in, the Congress had to in, enact uh, that at the end of 1942, um, that women would be in there, but there was already a group there. We were in military. But if you want to see pictures afterwards, I got them. It uh, shows everything. <laughs> but that's how I got interested in getting in there. And I said, I found some muscles I didn't know I had. <laughs> <laughs> So women were involved in the service even before the wax, which most of us have heard of. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I have a, a question for uh, Milt Krippa next, and that is, you talked about coming home from war, and uh, I, I imagine all of us are going to remember your story about loading all your pockets with bottles of whiskey. I, we thought about asking you how many pockets you had, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I didn't hear you. Well, uh, I was talking about your return from war. When you came back uh, the first time from active duty and landed in Chicago on VJ Day and came to Danville um, with your bottles of whiskey in your pockets, my question is this. Whiskey in your pocket. Oh, I had a field jacket. A field jacket. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't... Uh, that, I got uh, discharged from Fort Sheridan, uh -huh. and uh, she they gave us many, what they had. She wanted to know how many pockets you had. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> and, and my serious question for you is, um, when you re-enlisted, how did you feel about re-enlisting after your active duty? Hey, going home. I came back to Danville and I couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought I was psycho because I was combat infantry. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of me. I get in trouble with the foreman or something like that, and I'd think about killing him, you know. So I couldn't get a job and I re enlisted. Mm -hmm. And I re enlisted every year from then on until I retired. Mm -hmm. This became a second home. Mm -hmm. It was a good career. <laughs> uh, Dr. Suley, I, I had the opportunity to chat with you and Mr. McCormick for just a moment before we began, and uh, I, was, I was trying to think of uh, something that I wanted to ask a couple of different people, and so I'm going to ask you and Mr. McCormick the same question, I think. Um, how, did, how did the war change you? At the end of the war, were you the same person that you were at the beginning? How were you different? <clears throat> well, my mother said uh, I picked up after myself a little bit better. <laughs> 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 Military courtesy uh, inculcates discipline, and I was much more disciplined, <laughs> take care of my room and doing errands for her. I uh, didn't last long, but uh, <laughs> uh, the Navy taught you how to keep your clothes yeah. uh, in order and take care of yourself. That's true. All right. <laughs> Military discipline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mr. McCormick, how about you? How did the war change you? In what way were you different when you returned? Well, I agree with what Dr. Sumitoli uh, said. You can't hear you. I agree with what has been said. Uh, I would summarize it by saying that I think I matured. Not completely, of course, because that takes years and years. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was older. I had seen a lot of things that had gone on. I met some fine men 
there were a few who could stand improvement. <laughs> but that's all right. We all need that. That's right. Uh, it is a, I was very happy. I, I affected my feeling toward my parents. They had gone through a lot of things, as many parents, all parents who had men and later women in the service. So maturity is, is what I would say I felt greatly in favor of and, and thank the Lord for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dukes, um, when you escaped from the Russian prisoner of war camp, you, know, you, you said that you and a friend stole a pair of wire cutters and cut your way through and um, went across a minefield. Did you ever see your friend again after that? <clears throat> no, uh, we got lost in the woods and uh, he was a Texan. And I don't know what ever happened to him. I never did find out. But I got a little stupid. <clears throat> I went into a barn and uh, filled my pockets full of grain. I was starving. And I stumbled across a cow. And she let out a big moo. And the farmer heard that because of, the barns are right next to the houses over there in those farms. Mm -hmm. So I go barreling out the door and cross the field. And, and I knew there were some Russians there. So I hid in a, <clears throat> a thicket. But they... Rousted me out and put me in a truck, and I went back to prison camp again behind barbed wire. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there. Uh, next day, that night, I hid out more or less, and then that night, I found the same place on the wire. And uh, see, the Russians, usually that wire was elect electrified, but everything was so fouled up in that camp that everything was shut down. So I went through the same hole the next night, and I more or less found the path that I'd gone through on my belly to, to avoid the uh, mines, because there's a mines for about 200 yards. Mm -hmm. And I got back in that same woods. And then I used uh, my Boy Scout wilds and north, used the North Star, and I headed west. And after the morning of the fourth day, I come across the Elbe River, and I went down to a place called Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. And there's a big iron bridge there but it had been blown, but there was a Bailey Bridge. And I was there, I got in there at night, and I passed out more or less. And then the next morning, a big truck, six by one, the other side of the river, with some Russians. And they allowed out, that we were still exchanging one Russian for one ally. That went on for uh, maybe a month after the war was over. So they let one Russian go, on, and I was allowed to go across the bridge, and I had to crawl <clears throat> on my hands and knees and my stomach, because it was just a Bailey Bridge, and there was no railing or anything. It was on a pontoon bouncing around. I almost got seasick. But I got across and got on the truck and got into Halley. And that's all I remember. Uh, I only weighed 109 pounds, and I passed out from starvation and woke up in the hospital in Reims, France. Mm -hmm. They took my clothes. I'd see, I lost my uniform, so I didn't have a uniform all year long. I had... Just, the only thing I had was my shoes and my under, underwear. Everything else was gone. Dr. Canapel and Mrs. Canapel, thank you very much for coming. Um, we had a chance to talk a little bit before the program, too. And uh, I, I posed a question that I hope Dr. Canapel will answer for us, or try to answer for us. It's a little bit complicated. Um, I wanted to know if a doctor looks at war a little bit different than other people in the military. Does war seem different to you as a doctor? Did you hear that? Did you get that question? Uh, excuse me, what was the question again? Right. Um, the question is, as a medical doctor, how did the war seem to you? Uh, well, I think we were very quickly faced with that. With, when our 89th Station Hospital was the first complete hospital to be sent across to Australia. And uh, they were minimally informed. And there had very few troops. Far enough that they could be sh sh 
Now, Mrs. Canapel, I could hear part of that, uh, but not in its entirety. Could you give us a couple of highlights from that? Well, uh, he was with a group of uh, the, the uh, 89th Station Hospital was divided up. So there were two doctors and I think seven uh, enlisted men. And they followed the troops in uh, as they invaded uh, uh, going up New Guinea. And uh, so uh, uh, the troops would go in and then they, uh, the nine men would go in and uh, bring out the ones that were uh, uh, injured. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, the one, they would take them back to their little uh, unit, which uh, consisted, uh, this nine, a group of nine had uh, tents on the shore down further on the island where it was a little bit safer. And um, uh, they would then take care of the ones that were, uh, could be uh, cared for there, and others were sent back to Australia. I think that's what you wanted. All right, right. I appreciate that. And I, I think at the beginning, uh, we were hearing about uh, the arms that the doctors were issued also. Is that, did I misunderstand? Uh, yes, uh, I don't think that uh, he got to keep arms. And they were, okay. uh, th they had um, originally uh, uh, some things on their, show, uh, on their uniforms that indicated that they were medical mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but um, the, they found out later that that was only a target. So they yes. were, they were yes. required to take those off. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was over there. Uh, uh, he went into service, uh, and uh, he was over there about three years um, uh, in, the, in the service. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think John Sant's son is here. Is that correct? No? Oh, well, I've, uh, John Sant, I think, was the first interviewee. And uh, he was the one who kept a journal. I was going to ask how his father managed to get the journal out. Well, I have one more question. I think Sparky yeah. Songer. Yes? Did you have uh, his daughter? Oh, yes. Could you make yourself, where are you? All right. Do you know how your father managed to keep his journal? Because we, we saw a page of it photographed, and we could see his, uh, what they had for lunch and dinner, the slices of bread and so on. Um, how did he manage to keep that journal with him? Do you I know think the, story? the uh, it came in the Red Cross package, the blank. It was like mm -hmm. the old blue books we did in college. Mm -hmm. And he just kept the journal in prison camp. I've, I've seen it and I've read it. There's poetry in there that were written by guys in his barracks. He has a list of absolutely everybody that was in his barracks, what they ate, what they read. They had a whole list. They were able to get books for the Red Cross that sent them, so they were nothing else to do but read. And they read. So all this is just cataloged in this journal of his. And I think when the war was over and they were releasing the uh, POWs from the prison camp, it was just part of his personal effects that he brought home with him. Okay. All right. Well, it's, it's such a wonderful piece of history, such a wonderful artifact. Yeah. I believe he did all the artwork. Mm -hmm. He ended up being, becoming an engineer, so he certainly had a knack for that kind of drawing. Well, the wonderful artifact leads me uh, to our other panelist, and that is Mr. Songer, Sparky Songer. Um, <coughs> you've devoted your life to a certain extent to Veterans Affairs. That's what you've always been involved with. Is That's this right? Story of my life. Well, uh, when, when was the moment that you decided that was what you were going to do? What made you decide that? First of all, I was discharged November 45 from Europe. And I, uh, my brother just got out of the service also, and we opened up a truck stop, in, or we bought a truck stop in Petersburg. Anybody in here? Knows where Petersburg is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 21 mile. Uh, it was a busy highway. 041 was a busy highway. 
and we had a chance to open up the truck stop and uh, or buy it. And uh, the GIs were just getting out of service, and they were buying the old GI trucks that was surplus. And they would buy a trailer from somebody that was about half broke down, needed wheels and tires, and they got the old military vehicle working, and they would go to Florida and pick up oranges. And then they'd take them down to St. Louis and drop them off. And then they'd come up hauling something that was going to Michigan or Chicago. And this was the way most of your truck lines started. Broken down equipment, old tires that needed vulcanizing. If you've ever been around an old tire shop and they vulcanizing inner tubes, it was a great smell. I don't know what it was. It burned in a patch and put it on there. You could get a high smelling that stuff. At least but, they didn't uh, do about mustard. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, and then I went into town and opened up a kid hangout. We all had kid hangouts. Each little town had one. Ours were called the Cardinals. Covington was the Blue Moon, or Wabash Moon. And uh, Attica had the bloody bucket. <laughs> the Petersburg boys go to Attica because we thought they had the prettiest girls. <laughs> Attica guys come to Petersburg, they thought we had the prettiest girls. And at Williamsport, we divided them up. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, the kid hangout was going great guns. And, uh, and then a friend came in from Brooklyn, visited his sister, and he fell in love with Petersburg. He'd never driven a car. In Brooklyn, you don't drive cars. You take every kind of a transportation, but an automobile. And uh, he started tending bar for Frank King, who owned the bar. I had the kid hang out two doors up. And he came in one day and said, Sparky, you want to go with me and buy Frank King's bar? He wants to sell it. Well, I spent a lot of time down in Frank King's bar, and I thought, <laughs> why not? Kill two birds with one stone. So we borrowed the money and bought the tavern. And back then, no television. So everybody came to the tavern. The war was over. Everybody's enjoying life, happy. No fighting, no uh, screaming or fist fights or anything. They'd come in the tavern and to have a good time. And I did too. Uh, things were going great guns, uh, but I found out he was cheating on me and I confronted him about it. And uh, he took off and I've never seen him to this day. So uh, I, buddy of mine, another buddy of mine was a first, 101st Airborne. He jumped to D-Day. He had the Silver Star, he was highly decorated. He couldn't plant both feet as a civilian, and I didn't like it either. Uh, and he joined the Air Force, which I thought was impossible. No, he said, I, I joined the Air Force and I'm a recruiter. Look at the new staff car they gave me. He had a new staff car. He was living in Crawfordsville in a hotel room. Every afternoon he'd stop in my tavern and have a beer. He said, boy, the Air Force is a great outfit. You better join it. I said, well, golly, I might do that. My other buddy, who was a World War II vet, said, I'll go too if you will. And I said, okay. We signed up. Get a long way from Petersburg. We hated Petersburg. Small town. Rumors are flying. So what happened? We went to Annapolis, joined, signed our name. That same evening, we came back on the same swallow coach bus that took us to Annapolis, stopped in my hometown. We got off, we was going to Chinook Field over here, it's just 35 miles. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent 32 years there, Bill spent four and more. I went to Amarillo, Texas, and I was, uh, had two more years there, and I was about ready to get out, and they said, Sparky, you first on the list to go to Japan. You still want to go to Japan on the voluntary list? I said, I don't know. Uh, next month, I, I'm either going to get out or re-enlist. I don't know what I'll do. But I've been dating a young lady, beautiful young lady back here in Danville. Her name was Eloise Cooper. Some of you might have known Eloise. She's a 1947 graduate. 
And I was in Amarillo, and I said to the sergeant, I said, let me call Peter, I mean Danville. I want to question a young lady that I know back there. Okay, I'll let you know. So I called her in the daytime. She was working at Consolidated Foods. And I said, hey, Eloise, this is Sparky. Said, yes. We'd only date casually. We weren't madly in love. I hadn't bought her a ring or nothing. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm clear on that. Here's in Amarillo, Texas. She can date who she wants. I'll date who I want out here. It's, it's fair enough. Now, I was 20, 26, no, 27. No, in fact, I was 29 when I got married. I better get that straight. Um, so I, I called her and I said, Eloise, you want to get married and go to Japan for three years? <laughs> she said, what? And I said, you want to get married and go to Japan for three years? Are you drinking? And I said, no, I'm not drinking. It's the middle of the day. I know you, that doesn't make any difference. Uh, so I said, well, I'll call you back tonight and give you a three or four hours to make up your mind. So I did. And she said, yes. <laughs> so I went down and re-enlisted. got a big bonus, about $300. <laughs> went downtown, bought me a suit, which I never bought a suit in my life. It was always sport coats and things. And the old boy that sold me, I said, the jacket fits fine. The pants are big, but I'll take care of that. And it'll be ready for you Friday. I said, okay. I went down, paid him for it. Never checked it, never put it on. Put it in the car. Drove straight back from Amarillo, got her, we went down and got our license, blood test, and I told her, I said, now we're going to Kokomo, Indiana, tell your sister and brother-in-law, get us a minister after our services, and he can marry us. Don't tell him by it. We're going to do this in secret, because I only got a few days, I got to go to Japan. Okay. So we got ready for the wedding, I put the pants on, I couldn't find a pocket, neither hip pocket or right pocket, he had taken them and stood them together. <laughs> So I was terribly embarrassed. I never took my jacket off. I couldn't I put my billfold in the front pocket and all that. Anyway, we, the minister who married us after the service, we got to compare notes about the Battle of the Bulge. He was captured exactly the same time I was. He was a chaplain at the time. And we had a long conversation and a great conversation about, of course, officers were treated different than PFCs and corporals, Charlie can vouch for that. Um, but same token, we had a lot in common. Didn't know a thing about him when I arrived there. He knew about my hip pockets because I was rather mad and I probably used some language that he had never heard before. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, we went out and had dinner. And uh, so everybody, we came home and said, we're married. Married. My father-in-law never had to pay for her wedding. He had four daughters. That's the only one he didn't have to pay for the wedding. So him and I got along pretty good. So we went to Japan for three years, came back, and went to North Carolina. Never heard of that place. It was another fine place. Well, so we had a good 20 years in the Air Force. She loved it. Her kids were raised in the Air Force. Uh, we traveled a lot. My last assignment was Thailand. And if you've ever been to Bangkok, you can see all those beautiful buildings look like they're gold and all that. You get up close, they're not beautiful at all. It's just cups and plates that they broke, have broken over the years and they glue them on the outside and makes it from a distance. And the steps are just like that. So don't go there and expecting to climb up to one of them because there are no handrails. Oh, my. I got about 20 steps up and I got scared as all get out, had to sit down and come back down. <laughs> the monks can do it. They, 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 they're young and they fly up and down those things. Anyway, that was 20 years of great, uh, my military was total 23. And uh, I was with a group in Thailand, uh, the Air Force. We had 10 planes shot down in my squadron, there's three squadron to a, a, a wing. I lost 20 officers, 10 pilots, 10 electronic warfare officers. That was the hardest part in my life to see those young, highly educated men 
take that F-105 up over North Vietnam and never come back. <coughs> Disappear. Shot down, wound up in Hanoi Elton for five years. I was 41 at the time. I was old enough to be some of, a few of their, fa uh, some of their fa uh, a father to some of them. But I knew all of them because I worked directly with them. I was an air crew life support. Anybody who's been in the Air Force knows what that is. You work with their G suits, their helmets, their parachutes, their, all this kind of stuff. So you, you get well acquainted with them. In fact, too well acquainted. I cried a ton of tears. Yeah. I hated every damn Sunday we'd lose two or three airplanes. You'd have to go through their personal belongings and check it and make sure when you sent this back to their family there wasn't something there should not be there. So you would have to package that up. I didn't, we had an officer in charge that took that responsibility, but I just assisted. It was a dirty war. Now one of them was a Medal of Honor recipient. He's been on television and he also has worked with the History Channel, putting back a, a documentary about the, uh, call it the suicide missions over North Vietnam from Thailand, Takali, Thailand. And uh, he spent five and a half years, but he is a Medal of Honor recipient. I know him, I've talked to him by phone, and but his, Electronic Warfare Officer, Captain Johnson. He stayed on, retired as Brigadier General in the Air Force. I've never talked to him, I've never seen him. And but it's a joy to know these people, mm -hmm. and I loved it. Thank you. And I apologize for having to interrupt you, Mr. Songer, but I, I think we've gotten the idea of why Mr. Songer has become so involved in this. This yeah. was his life. It sounds as if you were one of the people who, from the very start, realize the importance of sharing stories with It's a joy veterans. to serve your country uh -huh. and I wish all young people would get that in their head and go out and try it. I'm well, honored to have the opportunity to serve my country. Yeah. Now this, I think, is probably a good time, high time, to get questions from the audience. So please, you can address specific questions to members of the panel. Yes, we've got one right there. This is for the camp owls. I remember you telling me about uh, Tokyo Rose when I was interviewing you. <laughs> I thought these guys might want to know about it too. All right, Tokyo Rose. Well, Tokyo Rose was, I wasn't there. <laughs> I just married <laughs> Bill 61 years ago after he got back from service. Uh, but. Uh, I'll tell it because I think it's easier for me than it is for him. Uh, uh, Tokyo Rose was a person uh, uh, who talked to the vet, uh, talked over a radio, and the veterans liked to hear the music that uh, was played with her program. But so one night, uh, she said, uh, uh, told them that their their uh, camp and the uh, Air Force and uh, another camp. Am I saying this right, Bill? That's right, Nubadura Air Force. <laughs> what? Nubadura Air Force. Nubadura Air Force, uh, airport, is that right? That's right. Um, uh, was going to be bombed out the next day. And uh, uh, so uh, they, uh, I guess that they dug their trenches or something. And um, the, the next day, uh, the uh, Air Force uh, area nearby uh, uh, that was also going to be bombed out, they got up and were ready for the ones coming, the Japs coming down. And uh, well, the men uh, in the camps and everything got down in their trenches, but they could um, uh, s start watching uh, sticking their heads up above and finally they could sit up and watch it because uh, uh, every one of the our planes took a, 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 
f finished off the, the Jap plane and uh, uh, out in, in the sea before it got down there. So the, there was nothing that happened uh, back at that time, and all, the, all of the men could sit up on, their, uh, on the edge of their trenches and watch this take place. Uh, I will also say that Bill didn't stop taking care of veterans after he got back from service. Uh, he uh, uh, was uh, with the uh, with the VA taking care of veterans, and after that, for 40 years. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question from the audience? Yes, back there. This is for Charlie. Charlie, uh, at one point before you got captured, you and another buddy, I think, had got some loot from someplace, a bank or something, and you, you buried it, and then you couldn't went back to try to find it. Did you ever go back again and try to find that? No. <laughs> the, the funny thing about this is that uh, in uh, the Netherlands, they wrote a, <clears throat> an article about me. I had a picture of my book and uh, a map of the area that my combat division fought in. And instead of bragging about how much the Timberwolves did to help the people in the Netherlands, he dwelled on the story about me and two of my buddies robbing a bank. And it was one of those days we'd been in combat night and day and really messed up, I guess. And we went into this town and nosing around, uh, it was, I think, what the name of that town was, uh, Gracie? It, well, anyway, I saw this vault. Well, I'd been a banker. My father was a banker, and I'd worked in a bank for when, when I was in high school. So I said, this is a bank vault. So we worked around and broke into it, the three of us, with pitch black, and we found a, a box full of Dutch gilders. So there were three of us. So we went out in the night, and I found a little monument, and I, met, I walked six steps north, I thought was north of the monument, and we took our trenching tools, of course we were in full combat gear, dug a hole and buried the, the uh, loot. And then I made a map, and I tore it in three pieces. <clears throat> and the idea was, when the war is over, we'll come back and dig those Dutch gilders up. <laughs> <laughs> well. Unfortunately, the other two of my buddies were both killed in combat. Uh, one of them, George Will, died in my arms, in fact. So they never, I didn't know, they never came back. So I was in London, and uh, I had a seven-day delay en route uh, to get home. And I, and I, I went AWOL, that's another story. So one night, <laughs> I got talking to some of my Canadian buddies, and I was telling this story, and they said, why don't you go back and try to find that money? So. I borrowed the civilian clothes off of a girl that I was more or less dating, dancing with at night, and she loaned me her brother's civilian clothes. I changed clothes and went across the channel at night and got into Holland and found the village, and I worked all day long trying to find that. I had no idea, I think that's the wrong place probably. I had no idea where it was, and the map, of course, was gone. And uh, I worked all day, no luck, sacked out on the ground that night, and then I tried a little bit the next morning, and I figured that I'd waste my time, so I went back to, to London. But, you know, of all the stories, he had to tell that. <laughs> and, and then he said, if, if you see people digging around out here, it's because of Charlie Dukes' book, and they're still looking at it. <laughs> <They're still laughs> and, and it was all in Dutch. So... Uh, beside the point, I got a couple of friends in Holland I'd met, or I'd, they met me through the internet, and their two sons have a uh, museum, and I have my own private museum at home, so we've been trading back and forth. So she sent me this article, all on that front page of the uh, newspaper, or the, yeah, the article, and then she interpreted it for me in English. So I guess there's been quite a st stir over the... <laughs> That bank thing. Well, they decided it was not, they said, he said it was not a bank, it was a spa where the rich people would go, you know, to rest, relax and so forth. And they had the vault where they put their valuables while they stayed mm -hmm. there. And they think that's where you work. 
Well, we, we were somewhere out of it. <laughs> I think we have a question right back there. They were supposed to be our allies. Uh, the problem was I was on the other side of the Elbe River near Czechoslovakia in a forced labor camp. And when we heard the Russians coming, we made an agreement with, what, uh, I think there were only six guards left. There's 36 of us in the camp. 32 were left. Uh, three got sick and then disappeared. One of them uh, made an escape. So we made a deal with the commander, the commander fear we called him, and five of the guards with the agreement that they would take us to American lines if we would give them our word that we would not have them, you know, uh, treated by the Americans, mistreated by the Americans. So we had no choice. So we agreed and we took off the next morning. And by this time, two of the guys were unable to walk from malnutrition. So we rigged up a two wheel cart with rope and we had to go cross country. We couldn't go down the roads because they were filled with civilians. I mean, they just coming out of uh, Russia and, and Poland. So we had to go cross country and have to cross roads and ditches and everything else. So we got very uh, few miles the first day, sacked out in a barn. Next day at noon, we were done. And they woke up the next morning and uh, Russians had come in, Cossacks little short devils and couldn't understand a word they said in their own ponies. They came in and took over the town, found our guards, gave us a rifle, said, you, you guys shoot them. Well, you know, we couldn't do that. They're older guys. So they shot them. So there we were. Well, then the, the Germans made a kind of a counterattack and the Russians got on their little ponies and took off and we were surrounded by Germans more or less. So I hid in that town called Rosenthal. I hid in that town for six days. And, We'd hide during the day and come up at night looking for food. Well, the civilians didn't like us either, so we had a lot of problems. <laughs> and finally decided that we better get out of here. So we headed back to Hoyersburg. It took us two days. And then I took off on my own and uh, ended up in Poland at an uh, Air Force camp, hoping to fly out because they said they were flying them out. And I found out that was wrong. So another kid and I took off. We headed west. Um, <laughs> I got picked up, I was on a Polish tank, and the tank got hit, and I had my head split open and unconscious and rescued by two British boys. So we, when they passed me up, we headed east to get on the, uh, come out to the Dardanelles. Found out the war was over, turned around, came back, and I ended up in Berlin, and uh, I was in a, Woke up with a bayonet in my guts, and, and uh, they said, well, we'll take you to the American lines. Well, uh, they took me through Berlin and down to Luchenwald, which was a Russian. That was Stalag 3A, but it was under Russian control, so I was behind barbed wire. Well, why was it under Russian control? That's what he wants to know. Why was it under Russian control? Well, the Russians had come over to the Elbe River, and, you know, the Americans, uh, you know, we made so many stupid mistakes as this one of them. We, gave the Russians control of everything east of the Elbe River. And that, that's why Berlin was where it was under Russian control, because that's on the other side of the Elbe River. And uh, I was in that camp for seven days. And every night, a gang of us would take off, walking towards the American lines, that's all we knew. The next morning, trucks would come back, full of, the Russians would bring them back full of escaped prisoners and throw them back in the camp again. That went on for six or seven days. So that's when we decided I better get the hell out of there. So that's the only choice I had. And they took about 22,000 of our boys into Siberia. And some of them were my buddies that I was in <clears throat> prison camp with, out of the 36 men that I was with. And of course, the government, and finally a few years ago, uh, 10 or 15, admitted the fact that those are in Russia. And I have an endorsement on the back of my book of a woman from Texas who uh, has been to Russia, 
<clears throat> has got photographs of American grave sites in Russia. A personal friend of mine. So I know that happened. But uh, they kept, I roamed behind the lines for a month. And I saw more devastation there than I saw in combat. I won't even describe it. But they had control, the Russians did. And then the Americans let them, let them do it. And, and I'm sure we do have Mr. Duke's book at the library, right? Yes. I think, is there a question in, right in back? And then we have someone up here in front, too. I guess before I ask my question, there are lots of other veterans in the audience, too, along with the panelists. And I'd just like to say you thank you. I thank you to you for the sacrifices that all of you have, have made for um, people like me. Could um, we I perhaps appreciate that. Um, see who's a veteran? Could you, raise, could you raise your hand if you're a veteran of World War II? Let's see who else we have. Yes, thank you. And then, and then my question, I guess, is for, for anybody to answer. Because um, I've heard, um, you know, the stories of, of coming home and how difficult it was to, to readjust. And, and that's my question. What made it so difficult to, to readjust to, to home life? Mm -hmm. May I answer that? Go ahead. Go. Mm -hmm. Yes. I can answer if you want me to. My part of it, anyway. Yeah. Oh, wait. Go ahead. Was, that, was that Mr. McCormick yeah. down there? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. McCormick. Go ahead. Go ahead. One of the things. One of the things. Wait a minute. They can't hear you. We'll try again. One of the things that was difficult was that the things had changed in the States, obviously, and many people were living under different economic situations. And we, we were naive. We were very thankful we were home. We were thankful that our parents were still there or our wives or our sisters. Many things were different. That, that was part of the adjustment coming back. And I think that we should be very appreciative, frankly, of you people being here tonight. And I, I feel that your presence is very worthwhile. Also, I'd like to add one thing, and that is to thank Barbara Nolan. Channel, channel Will, W-I-L-L, and the many other people who participated in this give us a chance to talk. We have, and thank you again. Thank you. I think there was a question right here. What, what I was going to point out was what Mr. Dukes was saying would be confusing to many people mm -hmm. because the Russians changed sides. They were originally with the Axis, and, and uh, then they switched over and became al our allies against the Germans. And that made a very confusing situation where Mr. Dukes was involved. And then they changed again. They, they, they made an agreement, uh, I guess, the Americans and the Russians, and uh, the problem was on the exchange of prisoners, there was a lot of us on the other side of the river, they, uh, stupid government again, excuse me, when they, our government found out that the Russians that we were exchanging for allies were taken a couple of miles behind the lines and being shot. So therefore, they quit exchanging man for man. Shot by their own people. Yeah, yeah. The, the Russians were killing their own soldiers because they allowed themselves, as they said, to be captured. So that shut us down. That's why I was <clears throat> I spent more time behind the lines, I suppose, than I, some other people did because they run out of Russians to exchange. <laughs> and I, I, I was lucky. I got across a, a line 20 days after the war was over. And as far as I know, I'm one of the last documented POWs to come out of Russian control. Do we have another question? Yes, yes uh, I served in the Navy and uh, I was aboard the USS Denver in the Pacific. And uh, 
after watching Ken Burns' film, uh, became aware of the fact that how good the Navy had it and as far as the foot soldiers that served not only in Europe and, and all, the, all the invasions that took place out in the Pacific. And uh, I just wonder if there's anybody that could give me a, an idea of what the uh, ratio of foot soldiers to those like us in the Navy and the Air Force uh, might be and how, how good we had it except uh, maybe when our ship got torpedoed or whenever the kamikazes were coming within a few feet of your plane and uh, hopefully hitting us, but Matt, we did manage to survive most of that. But anyway, I'd like to have an idea of what, I, I just couldn't believe how many fellas served in very hostile conditions you know, uh, as a foot soldier, and I just would like to know what the ratio might be, like one to a hundred, or one to fifty, or well, the, the figure that I have come up with. Uh, in our army, we had seventy-three percent of us went overseas out of the sixteen million. The army was co composed of about eighteen percent infantry. Okay, in an infantry division, then that was fifteen thousand men, but only nine thousand of that was infantry. The rest was your rear echelon outfit. And they figured it took seven men in the rear to supply one man in the front lines. And the problem was, it's like in the Pacific and like in my outfit, I had two, and my division had 200 days of combat. My company that I went overseas with of 187 men, we had 263 replacements. So the original man, I'm one of the few original men that survived, and I survived as a POW. I mean, I suppose if I hadn't been captured, I might have died in the front lines. But I was wounded in both legs and unable to, to fight, out of ammo, out of everything. So very few of us did the fighting. Of all the prisoners, there were 136,216 documented POWs in World War II. About 110,000 came home. Most of them died in the prisons in uh, Japan. But of, of the combat soldiers, 37.5% have been discharged for psychiatric reasons. So my point is, it, yes, there were, there were soldiers, or I mean, there were people in the service, but very few actually did the fight. Like in the Pacific, they would go from one island to the next. And... Uh, bring in replacements and keep going. So the percentage-wise is 18% is were infantry divisions. So, you know, it was very few of them did the actual fight in and dying. I think we have either a question or a response back there. Sweet. Yeah, Okay, I agree with the young man to thank you, but I think it goes way beyond that. I think it's absolutely vital and critical that you tell these oral histories because if you don't, it is going to be the scholars or the politicians who are going to tell this story, and it needs to be told by those like you who participated. But on a lighter side, I guess I'd like to know when you were in battle and you went through all these horrific things, what was the first thing you wanted to do when you got home? Oh, good question. Oh, that's easy. Well, I, that's easy. I was in Connecticut in a hospital at, uh, in, uh, at Fort Benjamin. No, it, uh, as in, uh, I landed in Boston and there was a girl that <clears throat> lived up at uh, the way a little bit north of New York City, and she found out I was home. So I went up to her house. She had three brothers in the service, and the first thing I wanted was a butterscotch sundae. Oh. <laughs> I took three bites of it, and that's all I could eat. <laughs> Would someone else like to respond to that, too? What's the first thing you wanted to do when you got home? Yes, I was going to respond to that. My mother was a widow woman. She uh, was left with five children. 
I was two and a half when my dad was killed and I had a younger sister, I still have a younger sister and an older sister and I had two older brothers. She raised five of us by herself, no welfare, no nothing. Worked for $18 every two weeks. We ate a lot of squirrels, rabbits, chickens, and so on and so forth. Mom was the greatest woman I've ever known in my life. She always had a smile, but she loved us dearly. And when I was captured, it was two months before she knew I was dead or alive. Now, she already had one son in the South Pacific. He was in CBs. He was going from one eye and the other and building runways. My older brother was in Maryland. She had two son-in-laws in the service. And the sisters lived with mom back and forth. Uh, it was a time that when I was in prison camp, I was worried about her. I know she was worried about me, but I knew where I was at and I knew what kind of shape I was in. But I worried about my mother. And when I got home about two o'clock in the morning, we didn't have a parade or anything. Didn't want a parade. But I wanted, when I called from New York, the Red Cross gave us one call to tell your folks we're in New York. She screamed and I know she jumped up and down. Uh, and then we had to go through a processing center, Camp Atterbury, to get processed so we could come home. Took a bus from Camp Atterbury to Indianapolis, Indianapolis to Petersburg, two o'clock in the morning. I st we had to stop at Sunny Inn. The bus driver knew me because my uncle drew, drove for the bus line and I knew he knew them and he said, Sparky's coming home at two o'clock in the morning. And I called, they, at Sunny Inn I called and I told mom, I'm getting on the bus. I'm, I'll be in Petersburg in about 10 minutes. Well, she couldn't wait, and my older sister, I think they had a 39 Chevrolet then, and got ready to pull out of Sunny Inn on the highway, and around the corner, practically on two wheels, here comes this car right at the bus. I thought she was gonna hit it head on. <laughs> and got over to the ditch, and the car was lean like this. Mom jumped out, fell in the ditch, and the driver says, Sparky, I think they know you. And I, I said, they sure do, that's mom. So I got out and we stood there in front of that bus and hugged and kissed and cried, I know, for 30 minutes. That is the kind of, our families were like that, a lot of love in them, all the families. She loved my brothers just like she did me, older brothers and sisters and everything. She was a bundle of love. She died in 82, 84 years old, never remarried. And uh, she was my first love. Boys will, if they got guts enough, they tell you the mother is their first love. Mm -hmm. I went on and found another beautiful gal. That was my second love. But anyway, that's why I wanted to get home to make sure she is all right. I was afraid she had had a heart attack. Maybe she was dead. Because I had no contact with her for six months. She'd get a German card from me, but that was, that was just, I'd just say, hello, mom, I'm doing fine, everything's all right. I didn't want to bother her, I didn't want to tell her anything. He wasn't allowed to to start with, and they would rip it up and that, he wouldn't get, a, get through. So you just try to cheer your mother up. And when I was little, I'd go by a station where she's at and she's testing cream and she's at, at the window and I was going to school and I threw her a kiss. And I, I couldn't say sweetheart, but I call her tweetheart. <laughs> and all the years uh, as in the military, she'd write me back, hello, tweetheart. Well, people look at those letters now, why did she call you tweetheart? You was a girl. I said, that's between my mom and I. So uh, there, there's good times in back in those days, but your greatest generation is sitting here and out there we went through some hellish times, but we also went through some of the best times that this country has ever known. We had people supporting us 100, practically 100% 100 
during World War II. You'll never find that again. We've never had it since. We were proud, they were proud. Like Miss Montgomery, I've got a lot of Life magazines down there. It shows those who volunteered. They weren't paid anything, but they wore uniform, they marched, they prayed. No pension. They, no, they had nothing <laughs> other than they wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And they were. But God help us all if we don't get discipline back in the schools, in the families, and tell them why are we fighting now, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. And you as parents can accept some of the responsibility if we do. Now, Thank we, you. we officially are at the end of our program time, but Barb, should we just continue the discussion with the audience? Is there anyone who hasn't yet asked a question a that would like to? There's a question back there. Yeah, so, someone who hasn't asked a question yet. One more, yes. Um, this is for Charlie Dukes. Can you retell that story about um, the guy you met at Washington, D.C.? I remember you telling me that after the interview. It's uh, the tanker, the artillery, the, then the tank that came around. Yeah, about three years ago, uh, Gacy and I went out to Washington, D.C. to the, the, the uh, monument. And um, I was walking around in a store, and there's a gentleman come over to me. And I had a Timberwolf, which is my combat division. I had a thing on my hat, and he came over to me, and, and he shook my hand, and he said, uh, "Were you at uh, Lukenwald uh, at where well, we had my last battle, Eschweiler? I'm sorry." And he said, "You guys, we were up on the top. I was in the third tank. He had a third tanker division patch on his cap." So I took his hand right quick, and I said, you guys try to help us out. Then he says, yeah. He said, we were at the top of that hill, Hill 303, and our belly was sticking up over the edge, and when these, there were five Tiger tanks attacked us. That's one of the reasons that I got captured, because I was completely shell-shocked from 88th firing point blank at us. And he said, you remember looking up, he said, you guys were being slaughtered and we trying to help. Do you remember looking up and seeing a man crawl out of the turn of that tank on fire? I said, well, yeah, we all hollered about that. That was me. Of all the people that I ran into, he was a man that was crawling out of that tank on fire, part of the third tanker division. <laughs> May I say something yeah. a little bit? Yes. Um, yes. When, when we were first stationed in California, and while we were at the base, uh, I asked Jack, one the airman, I said, why are, are our planes supposed to be coming in now? When we looked up, we saw the rising sun on there. They did attack the west coast. A lot of people don't know that, because uh, they guess a military secret. And uh, so, they also had some people from Germany coming up in the rear of that base. Um, like I say that uh, during that war, nobody could go on strike. President Roosevelt put three unions out of business uh, and he put, manned the, all the railroads with uh, soldiers. And, and so anybody that rode on that railroad would have to sit on their suitcases because military had the sway of that. And uh, so I, and my brother, when he went from West Virginia on help me raise Annette, he uh, um, then went in officer training as, and he came out ensign on the Atlantic side. And he, when they went in the Southern France invasion, uh, he went off the ship with this group with walkie-talkies, and while he was there, uh, he was the only one that survived out of that group that went off the ship. And so uh, each time, you know, I said God was taking care of him and everything and all the rest that were there. And I said, we were, what we need now is a wartime spirit of sacrifice. Have everything that, um, that not thinking of ourselves. 
and we think about everything, what we should do for our country. And, and there's things that should be taught in school that they're not teaching now. That's all I got to say. It was an extraordinary time, and there are many extraordinary stories, obviously, from it. Uh, Mrs. Canapel, for instance, just mentioned to me rationing, which affected oh. everyone. Yes, I mean. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think we have an official close to this necessarily. Is there anyone else who has to make some final remarks? Um, I just want to say the formal questions are will end right now, but please go up and, and talk to our panelists. Yes, please. There's lots of cookies and punch. I hope you'll please uh, eat and drink that. And uh, the green evaluation forms, if you'd please fill those out, that really helps us, and Barb Nolan has those. And thank you everyone for coming and for the uh, participation of our panelists and the service to our country. Thank you.